So right now I'm working on a video to basically showcase Black Myth Wukong being capable of playing on the Series S. And this whole thing is a matter of possibly optimization from the developers. I'm going to also try to explain what a memory leak is in that video. However, this conversation caught my eye. This is one that we had had in one of my videos talking about Xbox and Game Pass and some of the other things. And also pointing out how this very notion that a lot of PlayStation fanboys have carried for a long time, that Xbox gamers don't buy games, is actually very funny at the end of the day towards those who play on Xbox. Because at the end of the day, when PlayStation actually money hats games and blocks games, it's for Xbox players who they say don't buy games to possibly go and buy the games and not only buy the games, but buy their platform, the PlayStation console to buy the games. Welcome to the Video Game Fight School channel. Thank you very much for tuning in. Our goal is to try to put reason and logic into the gaming conversation and thereby allowing for players to be able to kind of think about it and shun the prophets of doom who constantly just lie and pretty much put out inflammatory pieces just to make the whole thing interesting at the end of the day. Their plan's not going to work. Gamers are very smart people. I know that on the internet, you might see some absurdities. You might see some craziness. But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, you have to also be honest. We are a small minority of those who actually game. The majority of gamers are out there actually gaming. If you look at the views of a lot of these content where we talk about Xbox and PlayStation and the gaming industry at the end of the day, it's not that impressive compared to the people who are actually buying games. This ratio will basically let you know. However, in this particular space, we need to be able to find out what is true and what is accurate. And what is true and what is accurate is PlayStation basically has a very weak strategy because it needs to go and find third party publishers that it will pay money to bring their games to its platform. This is called money hatting. It is an anti-consumer practice that they basically continue to engage in over and over again. Xbox has engaged in this practice before. There's no doubt about that. But it seems like over time, they've decided, eh, we don't really need it because the PR that they got, the bad PR they got for Tomb Raider, I have never seen anything like that. Even though PlayStation had been doing it, I guess we can call it another Xbox tax. But hey, I'm already tired of basically slapping the examples all over the faces of these people that have been naysayers about the straight bias that you see against Xbox in the media. But at the end of the day, something was very interesting. See, in my comment section, a lot of people were talking about, you know, this whole Game Pass thing. And, uh, you know, somebody was saying something <laughs> along the lines of, you know, the Xbox Game Pass, uh, you know, proposition is not so profitable. Uh, well, it's actually is not sustainable for the industry because, you know, there's a, there's a lot that needs to be done. But at the end of the day, somebody pointed out that, well, the crazy thing is with Game Pass, you have PlayStation money hatting games, but they're money hatting the games from the so-called Xbox users that people claim don't buy games. Yet Square Enix, whom they've money hatted their games, are running head on straight to PlayStation's arms. It's quite interesting at the end of the day because apparently money hatting games is damaging to a brand. I guess Square Enix is starting to see that because they had Final Fantasy 15 on other platforms, then somehow they skipped 16 because they wanted to go over to PlayStation and take the money deal out of it. Having seen now that this is not something that can actually help their brand because Final Fantasy, according to PlayStation fans, is not impressive in its quality for many of them. I mean, that's a sad reality, to be very honest. I'd hate to see a game like that that I've known about. I mean, I'm not a Final Fantasy player nor fan. But one that I've known about for many, many years actually fall into this kind of, a, you know, a situation or a conundrum. Because, I mean, think about it, ladies and gentlemen, you know, if a game like this, uh, like Final Fantasy cannot appeal to its fans, it's just it's rough for them. And they're also seeing the writing on the wall, even PlayStation themselves, for them to be able to sell games that are at least 20 million copies, they have to actually, you know, depend on the PC platform to hit that number. I showed you guys, uh, you know, this chart the other day which shows that PlayStation's highest selling games have needed a PC port to be able to shift a few more copies to push it up the ranks. I think the one that basically was able to actually stay on point was Marvel Spider-Man that hit the 20 some, some million copies uh, by itself and then uncharted 18 million copies. But a lot of these games required the huge player base of the PlayStation 4. 
Square Enix's Final Fantasy games are dealing currently with the user base that's about 60 million now for the PS5. They don't have that user base available on PlayStation anymore. It's not there. And even when the player base of 100 million, this is on the PS4, was there, they were basically at a 20% or less conversion rate of their own, uh, you know, <laughs> of their own platform. So the PC platform has given PlayStation a boost while Square Enix is looking and saying, y'all are going on PC, yet you guys want us to basically stay on your platform as an exclusive. It doesn't really work out because Square also wants to see 10 million copies. They want to see 20 million copies, but they, oh, they, they understand inherently that they're not going to get 20 million copies in this kind of market with this kind of a behavior at the end of the day. I mean, if you actually think about it, like, you know, where in the world are they going to be able to get 10 million copies of PlayStation players to actually buy their games? I mean, these are PlayStation players whose enjoyment and their main games comes from actually playing <laughs> Call of Duty and Epic Games' Fortnite and, you know, other free-to-play titles. So in order for them to be able to actually gain this kind of sales, they really have to diversify their addressable market, which is basically what Sean Layden was preaching in his particular missive talking about how exclusivity is your Achilles heel because you just don't have enough people to sell your game to. So this whole conversation about the money hiding of games is getting more and more funny because again, at the same time, it's a failed strategy. And even the companies that are doing it, especially the ones that are mature are starting to see it. And I said this a long time ago, because of everything that's going on, because of how Xbox now is gaining more and more users, believe it or not, as Call of Duty is approaching with the beta and all of the above, Xbox is more than likely going to be shifting and gaining more subscribers who get into the ecosystem and learn what it's about. That's exactly the biggest uh, you know, threat right here because the moment they learn about Game Pass, it's now an option in their minds. And I think that's the marketing for Game Pass that many people necessarily haven't taken into account. Now you can actually play Call of Duty on Game Pass for a small subscription fee, some for even a dollar at this point getting into that platform. And as more and more players are starting to recognize what, you know, Xbox has to offer, more developers are also seeing as an opportunity to basically take their brands to those platforms. What that's going to mean is many of the big developers are going to leave this exclusivity deals that they sign with PlayStation, especially on the second party front. The second party front is still in a position where most of them don't really have, you know, that kind of funding yet. And most of them are still skittish. You come into the industry, that's a very challenging industry. You see a little bit of money, you want to keep your devs, you know, jobs, you want to keep your studio open, and then you take the deal. But some of them are probably going to break out. And once they break out, they're no longer going to sit there and sign these exclusivity deals. In fact, what's even crazy right now is also Remedy. Many of you remember that Alan Wake 2 pretty much, you know, was financially strained. And Alan Wake 2's financial strain was actually very straightforward. The game could have just, you know, simply made its way to Steam. And Alan Wake fans would have been really happy to patronize the game. However, it seemed like, you know, it was more expedient for them to be able to go ahead and farm Epic Games' money. And even with all the awards and all the accolades, the developers have basically not necessarily seen, uh, you know, a good return for their money. Not only that, the brand is now somewhat harmed because the biggest PC platform does not have your game. And it's still basically sitting as an exclusive on a different platform where people would have basically bought your, your game here. And you would have been fine because the game was one that was actually loved. But one thing they didn't realize is every game now these days is a niche game. If you're not a big you know, shooter, you're a niche game. You don't really have the affordability to be able to do any nonsense anymore. You really got to get your games out to more and more players at the end of the day. So it's very interesting because apparently these companies need Xbox. These companies need, uh, you know, other platforms to be able to get their games. You're seeing it on a PlayStation side. You're seeing it on a PC side. If you leave your games to stay on one platform, you're really, really going to hemorrhage cash. Even PlayStation themselves are not leaving their games anymore. And this already should signal to the industry that you need to start finding your, you know, your angles and your places to be able to go and put your games in front of more players because PlayStation themselves has to do the same thing. The only company that seems to not be perturbed is Nintendo and they understand their own market. They understand their business model. Their games to me do not look like they take a lot of time to make 
at all. <laughs> They've already got a certain kind of game that actually is able to stay on their platform. And there's a limited number of third party publishers on their platform to actually compete against them, which is actually a win win situation for them. Let me hear your thoughts in the comment section. Thanks so much for watching the video. I really appreciate you guys' time and audience. Hopefully we'll talk pretty soon in another one. Peace out.